Okay, so let me introduce our team, the team that we're working on. Uh, so the, our team at the Department of Economics consists of Uma Durr, who's a game theorist, uh, Bob Hammond, who's in industrial organization, Linda Morrill, who's at the mayor, who's in applied microeconomics, uh, and me, who I'm a game theorist. And this is part of the point of the composition of these two projects. The game theorists are interested in how the assignment procedure itself impacts the outcome, and then the sort of the industrial organization and the applied microeconomics is on how that changes the outcomes and how we can use that to measure it. Okay. We have been very lucky, we feel very grateful for the two different groups of the Wake County Public School System. And so we work with the Magnus Assignment Group, which is mainly Alice Cochran, Laura Evans, Wayne Barosa, and Tony Anderson Powell. Uh, and also the second part that we'll discuss you about is the research and outcomes group, which is with Matt Leonard and uh, Colleen over there. Uh, and it's been extremely, uh, we feel very uh, lucky that uh, it's just amazing to us how high quality the, both these groups of people are. And we feel very grateful for the, uh, for the relationship. So our objective in the school assignment here, so we actually, we have no objective. Our objective is just to achieve the objectives of what the, school, the particular school assignment wants to achieve. And so this is the case, we're talking about magnet school assignments. And so what we're hoping to achieve is the four pillars of the magnet school assignment, which is to reduce high concentrations of poverty, to promote diverse populations, maximize the use of school facilities, and provide innovative and expanded educational opportunities. And I want to talk a little bit later on about what levers that we have in the assignment process to actually impact some of these outcomes. Okay? So the first part of this is the design and implementation of the actual assignment process to kids to magnet schools. And so what this consists of is we have a set of students. The students have priorities that they, we, need, we don't know these, we need them to tell them to us. But we know the student sort of the student preferences. We know the student priorities and we know the capacities of the school. So for us, sort of mathematically, this is what we think of as a problem. Right? And the question is, what should the process be? Right? So I want to talk about first about the prior method, uh, hopefully to convey why this creates some perverse incentives and are problematic from the research standpoint. Right? So the, the normal method that's used for magnet school assignment, which is to say before people talk to economists, is, is in some sense a natural method. So you take the preferences and you try to assign as many kids as you possibly can to the first choice. Right? So you use it, uh, if too many kids apply to one school, then you use the priorities to break the tie. But for those are you assign as many kids as you can to the first choice. Some kids don't get in, so those kids you see if you can put them in their second choice. Those kids that don't get into second choice, see in third choice, and so on. Okay? And so the difficulty here, and this is in some sense a long way to go to explain why game theorists are interested in this, but we're interested in how does this change the incentives of the students to tell me to list their schools. Okay? And so what may take us a second to realize is that you've created some perverse incentives for the students, which is in particular, there's a common situation where you have high priority at one school, but it's not your favorite. And so the question is, what school do I rank first? And so if the school I really want is hard to get into and I have low priority, and my second school, well, I like that okay, but it's not my favorite and I have high priority there, then I have a difficult, difficult decision on my hands. Because what happens is that if you rank a school that you have high priority first, you'll get it. But if you don't rank it first, it's off, it's likely to fill up in the first round. So effectively what you're doing is you're forcing the student to gamble. She has a risky choice, which is rank her favorite school first and risk losing the priority of her first choice, or she has a safe choice, which is rank her se second favorite school first and be sure she's going to get it. Right? So the unintended consequence of uh, this, this assignment procedure, which is in some sense natural, is that you've changed the incentives of the students to report their preferences, and so in particular, you're really forcing them to make an uncomfortable decision and also to misreport their preferences. They're going to tell you that their safe school is their favorite school, and in fact, it's not. Okay. So, to give you a sense of what this looks, this is the actual assignment procedure. So, this is the uh, Annalise Hammond is Bob Hammond's child. This was actually our introduction to the project. She had to. Uh, she was applying to medical school applications, and this is the way it looks. She has to rank her schools in the right. Now, and unfortunately, this is cut off a little bit, and so Bob was a little bit too uh, early on in the process that right away. But below, they list all the mountain elementary schools. And on the far right, they tell you how many people have, uh, have chosen that school first. This goes on for two weeks. So by the end of the process, there are schools that you know that many, many, many school students are applying to it. And there's other schools that have few students who are applying to it. And so the point is, is that what schools you rank up here on the right is not independent of that information that you get. 
So, you know, we think about this, you can think about that. So we think the main source, the main problem with this is there's going to be inefficiencies, which is I'm being forced to guess at what's the best school I can get into. And if you're being forced to guess at what the best school you get into, it's likely that we both guess wrong. And then after the fact, we would have been better off in terms of exchanging the schools. Second, there's going to be stress, there's going to be regret. What that directly translates to a school system is, is that in the appeals process, you can have many more people complaining about their assignments. And so finally, what's kind of important for us is there's going to be priority violations, which is to say that a student gets into a school with low priority because he was able to gain the system instead of a student with higher priority. Now, all our power here, so again, we want to achieve the objectives of the school board, our power is in the priorities. So if the procedure doesn't respect these priorities, then that lessens our power to implement the outcomes we're hoping to attain. Right? So, it is a sort of suggestive evidence of this. So it was nice. we got to see a lot of data. And so one thing we got to see was just the web login data. And just using, did a student log into the system more than once? This is irrelevant to somebody who's just going in there to rank their schools, but to somebody who's trying to strategize the system. This is very relevant information. We're able to see that just logging into the system more than once, they have a 10% greater chance of getting into a magnet school under this system. Right? Which says that people are, our student parents are quite effectively gaming the system, we would say the assignment is not really reflecting the priorities of the school. Okay. So the nice thing about this is that over the course of years, this was actually created in the 1960s, but there's a group of operations research people and economists who developed what's really kind of, well, for lack of a better term, a magic algorithm, which has all the sort of the properties that we want. Uh, it's strategy proof, which is just a technical term for saying that no matter what anybody else does, the best things that the student can possibly do is tell the truth, rank their preferences truthfully. It respects the school's priority in the sense that there's never a student with lower priority who gets into a school above a student with higher priority. And, and some, in a very well-defined sense, it makes the best possible assignment that respects these priorities. So this is the assignment that the economists like. And you know, so that there's a Nobel Prize award for people who know that one. It wasn't me, but it was somebody else developed this process. But it's sort of a wonderful process. Right? So this is sort of suggestive evidence of the difference it can make. This was in New York City uh, with the old procedure versus the deferred acceptance procedure. And so you have a dramatic increase in, in sort of every possible level when you get your first choice, second choice, third choice, etc. I will say, take this with a grain of salt. This was a particularly bad procedure before, a particularly good procedure. In, in practice, it's something that's using a little bit better of a system. What you actually might expect to see is a drop in the number of people that get their first choice. And this is difficult to explain, but this isn't a real drop. Because right? what we are having is you're having a drop and we change the incentives or something in this report. And so on the old system, it's actually this number 24,000 is much, much less than that because you can incentivize people to leave school first. It's not actually their first choice. So even though this is dramatic, I'd actually say this is probably underestimating the impact of the actual process. Right? Okay, so actually. All of that is sort of a preview, so what I really want to talk about is how we can leverage the school assignment in a potentially interesting way to measure some outcomes. Okay. And so this is in particular, this is the second part that we've been working with Matt and Pauline on, is how can we use this assignment procedure itself as a natural experiment to get at some difficult questions. Okay. So, so we know that scientific method, uh, but roughly speaking, we want to ask a hypothesis question, construct a hypothesis, and test with the experiment. And this is really the part that's, that, that's a, a sort of difficult in an education environment. There's a, there's a fundamental asymmetry between things that we think are good for students and things that we think are bad for students. Which is to say that if I think something is bad for a student, then it's really tough to me to go to a student principal and say, I've got this great idea. I think it's really going to hurt the students. And so I need you to take a random group and we're going to try and hurt them. Right? That's not going to uh, get very far with them. And so, more broadly speaking, there's a number of experiments that are either impractical to implement because it would require completely random reassignment of different groups of people, or in some cases are unethical. We don't we're proudly following deliberately trying to hurt groups of kids. Right? So we're going to try to say how we can use the assignment procedure to get at precisely those types of questions, ones where we cannot provide do an actual experiment. So one as an example, we're going to just talk about this just as a high level, but the approach we're looking at is the impact of school start times on educational outcomes. Okay, so this is very difficult to measure in actual experiments. So the hypothesis is that starting the school early is harming the kids, just in terms of biorhythms and either sleep process. So I think an early start time is going to hurt kids. But I need a completely random assignment that the school start times are not random when the school starts at one particular time or another. 
And so I could never convince a, a superintendent to set up one school, randomly assign kids to it, and started it at a ridiculously early time. Right? This is just not something that an experiment like that can run. Right? But we're going to be able to sort of use the procedure to get at this a little bit. Right? So our challenge is what's our control group? The people who are going to the school from the early start time, the people who are not going to school for the first time. Right? And so the assignment procedure, the reason why the assignment procedure works so well is that precisely because the priorities are very close, which is to say that it's not individual level priorities. And so we have very broad classes, and who gets in is determined by who wins the lottery within these broad classes. So let me show you a specific example. So in the magnet, there's roughly four priority classes. Um, so if you have an older sibling that gets you into the school. But then we're looking at sort of high uh, areas designated as high performing. Students for its next faculty at school is overutilized or non-entry grade siblings of current magnet students whose first choice is their sibling schools. Okay. So roughly speaking, and then what's not on here is this big class of other people. Okay. So each school has a cut. In these courses, there's a lot of students in each priority class, and so you can think of a, of, a, of a school's cutoff as either being in priority two, three, four, or in this other category. And since there's many students in this category, there's a cutoff, and that just means the people who got in within that category and the people who got out within that category is just purely determined by random number. Right? The people above the bar got in, the people below that got out. And this is our source of our natural experiment because we basically effectively have to we're flipping a coin and sending one kid to school A and another kid to school B. Okay? And so this is what we're going to use as a natural experiment. And so when, you know, roughly speaking, this is what we're looking for. Children who have the same priority as the lottery numbers that you get in schools. Right? So this is also sort of, a, in, in terms of my objectives with the talk and what I was talking about the plants and the seed, is to try to think about, and, and so I don't, I don't know particularly all topics that are interesting. I'm trying to learn topics that are interesting, things that have potential impact. And so I'd love to know if there's something that you can think of where a magnet school kid going to school A or school B or back to his base school, which is randomly determined, an outcome that would be that we'd be able to use to measure that as our natural experiment. Okay, so this is roughly what we're going to use in our school start time project. We have some variation in the start times of the schools. Um, also, what's nice for us is that the uh, magnet schools are you know, by design far apart from where the students uh, are located. And so what we really could conjecture is that it's the start of the day that matters. And so it's really the combination of the start time and the bus time. And so combining this information, which is sort of uh, exogenous, we have this nice exogenous variation between this, we're hoping to measure the impact of a child who starts early versus a child who starts a little bit later, you know, on the impact of the performance. Yeah. And so, yeah, so roughly speaking, I think this is most fruitful in situations where we think that, uh, that we're looking at projects where it's a negative impact, not because we, that's what we want to study, but because we think that's the least likely where somebody can create a sort of a controlled experiment and where sort of the, the, we can use this variation that's inherent in the assignment procedure. Okay, so, you know, so this is our, our sort of rough summary of the work, okay, is that uh, if somebody works uh, in, in, a school, in a school district that has a school-based assignment procedure, that the particular design of the procedure is very important. There's unintended consequences with any particular design, and sort of and also the objectives of the school board are met or not met, depending on the route of the procedure that's being used. And so the first thing is to sort of think about, we would love to talk about anybody if they're using a school-based procedure, how to design a specific system. And the second part is to think about how actually the, the randomism here in that procedure can potentially be used to measure outcomes that are otherwise hard to measure. So, thank you very much. So does anybody have any questions? I have one. Um, I'm a Wake, Wake County Schools transportation, and during the process of when a public making decision on the purpose on a ranking on the school program. Doing your research analysis, did you find any correlation between the type of transportation offer and the way the ranking is produced? I uh, you see, you're talking about the, the preference ranking. Preference yes. ranking, there are parent transportation, right. they are expressed in their neighborhood. Yeah. Is, is that a contributing factor to the decision? 
Yeah, so we have not looked at that directly. Because, uh, so I wish we could convince sort of the bot team that does more of the experiments, but that's certainly something that we could look at, right? Because there's the three different categories and really rank the world into that. Um, and, and, yeah, and, and surely it must be the thing. I think as a graduate student that is working on how people rank the schools and why. So can I ask the, the final 10% that you fill the, the vacancies at, a pool that kind of filtered down to the bottom? Yeah. Are the, pardon? the first 10% actually. To okay. encourage participation, they take 10% and award it effectively randomly. And okay. then the remaining seats are according to those priorities, but including those priorities for people who don't meet one of those categories, but are missing the other. Okay. So a, oh, all right. Yeah. Well, that. So, I, so, but that ten percent is the randomized experiment. No, no. RCT. So that's part of the randomized experiment, okay. but it's even more so than that. So, ten percent are completely random. We're getting it. Mm -hmm. But even remaining that, let's say, the, let's say there's five hundred seats to an award. Mm -hmm. You can think of the last student to get rejected. Mm -hmm. He's in one of those categories. And so that means there's lots of people in that category. And so the big he just had some sort of random number. So let's say it's 0.95 or something like that. Okay. So what that means is anybody that category with higher than 0.95 got in, and anybody below that that got out. And okay. so there's, there's two sources of random numbers there. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I think my question is when you then distribute that. And this might still be at me being unclear when you distribute the, that 10 percent, because I guess I'm still seeing it as a pool of, of students, 10 percent left to distribute to all the, the magnet schools. Yeah, so it's a. I, I'll go back to this just purely okay. because I like this graphic. Right? <laughs> so I, I don't get a chance to use fancy graphics much. So I utilize this, right? We really just want two people who are the same mm -hmm. and are randomly going one way or randomly going the other way. Mm -hmm. So to excuse my language, we think of this in terms of lotteries, uh, which is probably not the right way to describe in this case, but we think of this as that you just, a student has a, has a probability distribution of schools they can go to. Maybe it's 10% of the school, 90% of the school. Mm -hmm. And so roughly what we're trying to do here is just group students that before we have a learned lottery number have the exact same chance of going to different schools. Okay. And so that's, it's complicated to do, but it's sort of a well-defined sense of just based on preferences you submit and the priority scores and the capacities we can determine students who before were in the lottery number had exactly the same chance of the two students. And so that is that is our group. And so roughly speaking, then the lottery number says the one that one school A and another school B. Mm -hmm. And that's our experience. Okay. Okay. I have what so how many students do not get admitted to any magnet school? And assuming that that number is greater than zero, have you used this to estimate the effectiveness of magnet schools generally in the district? Yes, yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so, so roughly speaking, about 62% of the people get into a magnet school, the ones that go back or uh, go to a basis a base school. And so that's sort of one question you can uh, uh, sort of get at, which is just measuring the impact of magnet schools. Um, and we haven't uh, done that uh, yet um, because mainly we're more interested in trying to match up with the colors of the, those four compared those questions, which is first that we'd like to get at. These particular questions, right? And so, which is to say that you know, we, all this is, say, is very early stages, and there's lots of different directions to go, and that's sort of the most correct way. But what we think will potentially be most interesting is how the particular mechanism is meeting the objectives of the school board in these dimensions. Right? But you're right. That's in some sense, and in, in we mean sort of the most likely, just mean the most source of randomness is between any magnet school and no magnet school. So in some sense, that's the most promising. But in the, yeah, and that, that's the approach used to estimate like the effect of losing the voucher program. Yeah, if you're familiar with, uh, so ours has nothing to do with charter schools, but there's some that integrate charter schools and don't charter schools, and so the most direct is the impact. The impact of a charter school is exactly using this type of experiment. A lot of them are saying some kids to charter schools don't need to raise their schools. And so that's very much an analysis. So is one of the possible um, outcome from this research relates to school start time and also the bus time is going to be the, the success as relates to the bus ride time and the school start time? 
Yes, so I mean, we, we have the wonderful position of being uh, completely agnostic and say that all, all our interest is in sort of reflecting the interest of that, sort of whatever's interesting to the school boards of interest to us. And so if the, if the idea is to come up with, if what they tell us is what they're most interested in is how can we use this under procedure to reduce school start times, uh, sort of bus times, there's sort of natural ways you could offer the procedure, uh, which is something where, so you, for example, you could use distance in the tiebreaker, so when you get a higher tiebreaker, it will show you less time or not. Um, in magnet's a little bit complicated, right, because half the, most of the, the main objective is actually to get people to travel distances from the suburbs into the school district. And so that particular would be a little bit complicated. Um, so it, it's, it's so it, you know, I mean, the transportation department, so this is a different thing. I'm, I'm sure sort of incorporating the how the sort of transport, the eventual transportation assignment is, is probably quite relevant to to me, it's just a question of whether or not that, you know, this, the beauty of this process is this the lever to try to achieve the objectives the school board has. Uh, as well. Thank you very much.